Today we're going to talk about the carbonate system and how carbon dioxide, calcium carbonate, and the intermediate forms of carbonic acid, carbonic acid, bicarbonate, and carbonate all work together to control the pH, total CO2, and alkalinity of aquatic systems. CO2 is added to a lake or the ocean through gas exchange and photosynthesis and respiration. So if the water is in equilibrium with the atmosphere, gas exchange will be zero. If photosynthesis is consuming CO2, then gas exchange will, ink, will transfer CO2 into the water. And if respiration is increasing CO2 in the water, then gas exchange will tend to decrease CO2. So here's our generic reactions for photosynthesis. CO2 plus water and light produces organic carbon and oxygen. Organic carbon plus oxygen can produce CO2 and water through respiration. The CO2 system then is regulated by the acid-base chemistry of the carbonate system and the general pH range is between 6 and 8.5. Our job today is to be able to make that calculation, the calculation of pH as a function of the CO2 system quantitatively for a range of natural waters. Our job is to calculate that for a range of, of natural waters and to do it in the context of the calcium carbonate system. So now it's time to do some chemistry. Let's begin by defining the concentration of CO2 right here in terms of the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere and a K gas, which uh, is typically referred to as the Henry's Law constant. Now CO2 undergoes a hydration reaction in water where CO2 plus H2O forms carbonic acid. <clears throat> This constant is pH independent, has a value of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 3. So what that means is that carbonic acid is about 0.15% of the dissolved CO2. So by convention, we don't talk about carbonic acid and CO2 as two separate species, but instead we lump these two together into one species, which are related through this constant, but not related to pH. So that's important. There's no proton transfer in this reaction. And that allows us to now write carbonic acid plus CO2 in terms of a K star and the partial pressure of CO2. So this is an algebraic convenience that allows us to now focus on carbonic acid as the only form of, of CO2. Gas phase CO2 can dissolve in water to form both aqueous CO2 and carbonic acid, which we will define as with an equilibrium constant K star. Carbonic acid can dissociate to proton and bicarbonate with an equilibrium constant K1. Bicarbonate can dissociate into a proton and carbonate with the equilibrium constant K2. Here's our first association constant. Here's the equilibrium expression, products over reactants. Here's our second association constant. Here's our equilibrium constant, products over reactants. In thinking about polyprotic acids, we often draw distribution diagrams. A distribution diagram has the fraction of each species on the y-axis pH on the x-axis, and this shows the overall acid-base chemistry of the carbonate system. Carbonic acid is the acid form of the polyprotic acid dihydrogen carbonate, and so it is the dominant species under acidic conditions. As we increase the pH to the first pKa, the 
carbonic acid concentration decreases, the bicarbonate concentration increases, they cross at the first pKa. We now form the intermediate form, um, which is dominant at intermediate pHs. As we increase the pH, the bicarbonate concentration decreases, the carbonate concentration increases, they cross at the second the pH of the second pKa, when pH equals pKa2. And then we can also see that at the pH of the ocean, at about 8.2, um, we expect to have mostly carbonic uh, bicarbonate with a little bit of carbonate. So to solve the system in terms of all the major players, we need to do a detailed carbonate mass balance and charge balance. The mass balance for carbon dioxide includes all of the forms of carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, bicarbonate, and carbonate. Notice that the carbonic acid is now lumped together, carbonic acid plus CO2. So this is total CO2. This is all of the inorganic forms of carbon dioxide. And this is the mass balance for the carbonate system. Similarly, we can do a charge balance and the total alkalinity is defined as the sum of bicarbonate plus two carbonates. This is the charge balance for the carbonate system. Because carbonate accepts two protons and has a minus two charge, we've got a coefficient of two out in front. And bicarbonate accepts one proton, we have a coefficient of one. So mass balance, charge balance. And because alkalinity is a charge balance, we can also think of it as the charge of the permanent cations minus the charge of permanent anions. Some students find this more intuitive, particularly as you think about diluting a system through rain or possibly concentrating a system through evaporation. Alkalinity is charge balance, so therefore it's the permanent cations minus the permanent anions. So let's pull all of this together in a systematic treatment of equilibria. I have my mass balance, total CO2, carbonic acid, bicarbonate, carbonate. I have my charge balance, total alkalinity is one times the bicarbonate plus two times the carbonate. pH is equal to the negative log of the H plus concentrate. The CO2 is related through the Henry's law constant to CO2 aqueous plus carbonic acid and then I have my K1 expression and my K2 expression. The pale blue boxes represent the eight unknown species in this systematic treatment of equilibria. And so you'll notice I have eight boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I have six equations, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six equations, and eight unknowns. So to solve the carbonate system, two of the unknowns needs to be needs to be defined. And by defining two of the unknowns, I now have six equations and six unknowns, and it now becomes an algebraically straightforward process to solve for all of the other species in the carbonate system. All right, so we're going to measure two variables. Which variables do we measure? We often measure pH. We often measure total alkalinity through alkalinity titration, and we can often measure pCO2, and we do that through gas exchange and then measure the infrared absorption of, of CO2. So to do this, we also know, need to know the values for the equilibrium constants, K1, K2, and K star. And fortunately, um, these have been measured experimentally um, as a function of temperature and salinity, and so we can go to tabulated values to calculate these equilibrium constants. So here's the reference from a paper by Frank Malero. Uh, these <coughs> K primes for a series of important acid-base species in environmental systems and this equation, ln of k prime, is fit to the function of a plus b divided by t plus c times the ln of t. The a, b, and c coefficients are fitting coefficients. They have no physical significance, but
but they do give us an excellent fit to the K here, K, as a function of temperature. So if you want the first K, you would use the carbonic acid. This is the K2. Um, these are the solubility uh, KSPs for, for calcite and aragonite, and we've thrown in the uh, KW for water and uh, the KA for borate because um, it was provided in, in this paper and they might be useful in the future. The salinity dependence, which we'll now call K star, is a function of the pure water K at a specific temperature, and then there's a salinity term S here, and these salinity terms are in parts per thousand, so I have a temperature coefficient to the salinity term to the half, and then B0 is the uh, linear correction. So I have now a function of K, again for each of these species, um, as a function of temperature and salinity. For our purposes, uh, K star can assume to be constant at 0 0.0338, and in the Excel spreadsheet um, that will be shown at the end of this presentation, I also have an, an algorithm for calculating K star. Now that we have our equilibrium constants, let's quickly review that we have six equations, eight unknowns, and we now have values for K star, K1, and K2. So how do we mess with a carbonate system? Well, we mess with a carbonate system by changing the pH, changing the total alkalinity, changing the total CO2, and this will change all the other species do, uh, <clears throat> as described by these equilibrium constants. That's our challenge, is to, to do those calculations. So physically, how do we mess with the CO2 system? Well, we can precipitate or dissolve carbonate. And if we dissolve calcium carbonate, we're going to produce carbonate ions. Well, carbonate ions will produce two units of alkalinity and one unit of total CO2. So this is important. If you dissolve calcium carbonate, you add two units of alkalinity because the total alkalinity is defined as the carbonate concentration times two, but only one unit of total CO2. Conversely, precipitation, which is the reverse of this reaction, consumes two units of alkalinity and only consumes one unit of total CO2. Looks like there's a typo here. I should have a two on the end of this. Well, what about photosynthesis and respiration? Photosynthesis consumes total CO2. It consumes carbon dioxide, but it doesn't change the alkalinity. And respiration produces carbon dioxide in the form of carbon dioxide, but doesn't change total alkalinity. And finally, evaporation and precipitation. Well, evaporation concentrates the water that you're looking at, so the total CO2 will go up and so will the alkalinity, but they're going to go up equally. And conversely, precipitation is going to dilute the system, and total CO2 and total alkalinity are both going to go down, and they are going to go down equally. So this gives us a qualitative way of thinking about how charge balance and mass balance, remember total alkalinity is a charge balance, and mass balance, total CO2, will change by physical manipulation of the carbonate system. To solve these exactly, we're going to take, uh, we're going to do an algebraic trick, which we call the dummy variable approach. And our dummy variable approach is to break the carbonate system parameters into a dummy variable, which we'll call V, and terms that are only defined in terms of proton, and proton concentration, and equilibrium constants. So, Carbonic acid, carbonic acid plus CO2, is going to be the dummy variable H plus squared. Carbonic bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, is the dummy variable K1H plus. Carbonate is the dummy variable K1, K2. And then using our mass balance and charge balance, total CO2 is the dummy variable H plus squared. 
H plus K1 plus K1, K2. It's the sum of these first three rows. Total alkalinity is the dummy variable H plus K1, that's bicarbonate, plus 2 times K1, K2, that's carbonate. And PCO2 is the dummy variable H plus squared divided by uh, K star. And that's the reference for this idea. So now what we're going to do is take combinations of these uh, equations, and that will allow us to compare, say, total CO2 to total alkalinity, or total alkalinity to bicarbonate concentration. And by doing the pairs, we're going to be able to cancel the dummy variable. So let's do that for total CO2 and total alkalinity. So here are my two equations defined in terms of the dummy variable. Take the ratio, the dummy variable drops out, and you get the relationship between total alkalinity and total CO2 is always H plus K1 plus 2 K1 K2 divided by H plus squared H plus K1 plus K1 K2. So since we can measure H plus and the K1s and K2s are a function of temperature and salinity, we can calculate this ratio. And that's what we do in what's called the dephase diagram. A dephase diagram is plots of constant pH superimposed on an alkalinity total CO2 system. So my x-axis is total CO2. These are in molar units, so this would be 1.5 millimolar total CO2. Y-axis here is total alkalinity. Again, the concentrations are molar, so this is 0.015 millimolar total alkalinity. pH, so at pH 6, you'd put in 10 to the minus 6 into the H+, plus, and you'd calculate this ratio, and that defines this line. If you go to pH 8, the line is above the pH 6. It's got a steeper slope. The alkalinity increases faster as the CO2 increases. And the pH 8 line is pH 7 to 8 lines here are just about have a slope of 1 to 1. This has a slope that's it's about 1 and a half, and this has a slope that's considerably less than 1. And again, the slope of these lines come right out of... Um, this relationship. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to superimpose chemical, biological, and physical processes onto this diagram. And I'm going to do it by assuming that we went out and measured a, a sample of water that had a total CO2 of a little over 0.001 or 1 millimolar right here, and had an alkalinity a little over 1 millimolar right there. So there's my dot in the center of this uh, dephase diagram. And we can now think about how the pH of the system will change if we modify it in terms of <clears throat> chemical addition of calcium carbonate, physical changes, evaporation and precipitation, or biological changes. So let's, let's add some calcium carbonate to the system. So let's add some calcium carbonate to the system. If you add calcium carbonate, you add two units of alkalinity per unit of total CO2. So the slope of this line is 2. And we move from the pH 8 line up toward the pH 10 line. So the addition of calcium carbonate increases the pH of the system. If you know how much calcium carbonate you added, you can calculate exactly what the new pH would be because you will now know that you're right here. Um, and you can now solve for pH or if you have enough of these lines, do a very good job of interpolating to a new pH. Conversely, if you were to precipitate calcium carbonate, the pH is going to go down. Precipitating calcium carbonate will consume CO2, but consume more alkalinity, and you will approach the pH 6 line. Biological processes, uh, respiration increases total CO2, but not alkalinity. So we're going to go from pH 8 toward about a pH 7, so that's respiration. Photosynthesis consumes total CO2. So photosynthesis consumes CO2, so our pH is going to go from 8 up toward 10 or increase. And finally, our physical processes, 
are not going to are going to change the total alkalinity and total CO2, but they're going to do it on a one to one basis. And it this initial starting condition, because we're on very much close to the one to one line, uh, physical processes won't change the pH or um, with through <coughs> excuse me evaporation or precipitation to a significant extent. But what if we move our starting conditions from here to here or from here to there? Then we could expect the physical processes to have a, an actual change in pH. So here we go. We now have decreased the alkalinity. We've decreased the total CO2. So now the physical effect is actually going to go from a pH of around 6 up toward a pH of 7. So physical processes don't always cause uh, result in no change in pH. It depends on the starting conditions of your system. And we can see that if we started with a system with a very high alkalinity, um, physical processes in this case will decrease the pH. Here, physical processes would have increased the pH. And you can make the same arguments for each of the other perturbations to the CO2 system. So let's implement these calculations using Microsoft Excel. We have uh, input the temperature, so we're going to actually implement these to phase diagrams. We're going to input the temperature in Kelvin. We're going to input the salinity in parts per thousand. Let's put those in here. These are the A, B, and C constants from uh, Molero's paper. Here are the A0, A1, and A2 constants. These describe the salinity dependence. These describe the temperature dependence. Um, I have focused on the K1, K2, and KSP in this problem. You can see K1 is around 4 times 10 to the minus 7, um, 4 times 10 to the minus 11. KSP is around 3 times 10 to the minus 9. The Henry's Law constant is computed through these coefficients, and I have the K star, which was in my PowerPoint, a 0.034. And then this is the K star as a function of salinity. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, salinity causes a decrease in the solubility of, of CO2. So let's go back to our dummy variable, Boach. This is total alkalinity, dummy variable H plus K1, 2 K1, K2. PCO2, dummy variable H plus squared over K star. So if I want to relate the partial pressure of CO2 in a lake or the ocean to the total alkalinity, I can do that by taking the ratio of these two equations. And that's what I, exactly what I wanted to do in terms of calibrating a in situ PCO2 sensor. So I took this equation, I took these equilibrium constants, and I implemented them. So here's how I did it. I put in the total alkalinity. I put in the pH. From the pH, I got the H plus concentration. So now I knew the H plus concentration. I know values of the Ks. So I can go into cell uh, B30, and you can see I've got B28, B28. B28, B28 is H plus squared. H21, that's the K star, that's that species right there. Uh, B28, F13, that's H plus, F13 is K1, and then 2 times K1, K2, there's K1, there's K2. All right, so that's the ratio between PCO2 and total alkalinity. Since I've defined total alkalinity, I now know PCO2. This is in units of atmospheres, and this is in units of ppm. So right now, the atmospheric PCO2 is around 401, 402 parts per million. Um, and so uh, with a total alkalinity of 0.002 over 2 millimolar, which is typical of the ocean, we expect the ocean pH to be 8.15, slightly less than 8.2. 
if we now go to a freshwater system and set the salinity to zero, um, we now have uh, a pH and, so, and continue to keep the pH at 8.15. Uh, we have a PCO2 that's uh, 922. And this is because of the, um, the uh, salinity dependence on these constants. So in fact, the pH of pure water, or, or uh, not pure water, but 0 0.002 lake water um, is closer to 7.5. You can come in here. Whoops, I went the wrong way. 8.5. Um, it's right around uh, 405 ppm. So uh, we expect at this alkalinity, fresh water to have um, a higher pH if we decrease this one, two, three, two, to a value that's more typical of Great Pond. Now we need to go to 7.5. That's about right. So at the alkalinity of Great Pond and a pH of 7.5, which is what we typically measure out on the lake, we have a PCO2 of 416, which is very close to the equilibrium partial pressure of the atmosphere. Um, which will be around 403, 404 this summer in Maine. Now, clearly that PCO2 is going up. We know it's going up by about 1% a year, uh, maybe half a percent a year. And so we will expect that the pH of Great Pond will continuous, continue to decline at least for the next 100 years due to the increase in PCO2. Off to the left here, I have the two papers that we use to do these equations. The appendix uh, reviews that dummy variable approach. Uh, paper goes into some more details about how we think about these uh, polyprotic acid speciation using the, the dummy variable approach. I hope you have found uh, this tutorial helpful.